Morning, CBT. Okay, you're awake. Great. We're here. An American was once on a road trip, he and his wife, and they drove up into Canada. After a long while, the wife began to have suspicions. I don't think I know, I don't think he knows where he's going. <laughs> okay? And the husband, of course, was not letting on. So she began to pester him, as is usually necessary in those situations, to get him to stop for directions. He finally pulls over, asks the man, rolls down his window, hey, where are we? And the man immediately responds, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. He quickly rolls up the window and he says, okay, I admit it. I don't know where we are. We're so lost. They don't even speak English here. <laughs> Apparently, Saskatoon is not much of a city. Uh, full disclosure, I've never visited there. Sorry. I saw a look from the back there on that one. Okay. Um, but in 1971, the city was special. On October 13th, 1971, Ebenezer Baptist Church, 165 people just started what they were going to be a normal series of meetings. And that first night, no one responded to the call to get right with God. The second night, a few people went forward. The third night, the third night, and the fourth night, a deluge took place. The irony was that they had actually set aside 15 counselors to help people to be ready if someone wanted to come forward, confess sin, pray, etc. But it was actually those 15 that were some of the first to race to the front to get right with God. Time suddenly started passing very quickly. Music ministry was set aside and they just prayed and confessed. And the meetings were lasting till 11 p.m. each night. Two weeks later, they were still meeting. Except they had to move to an Anglican church, which could house 600. <laughs> another local church, <laughs> you'll love this, intentionally planned another event, you know, to keep their sheep at home, so to speak. Okay? And they did the unthinkable they canceled because they recognized that they needed to be a part of what was going on that October in 1971. Pastors, deacons, everyone were being revived. The gatherings became larger than 1,600. 20 churches were now involved. Many canceled all their programming except for Sunday morning services. It was something incredible, so different, that one of the pastors, one of the local pastors said, we're just walking knee deep in love. Revival had come, and in the coming months, it was as if the prairie provinces of Canada had caught fire, and it spread purifying God's people. The revival meetings in Saskatoon didn't end for six weeks. Every day, six weeks. And the revival continued to spread to other cities and lasted for years. Sadly, I'm sure most of us are not familiar with this particular revival because it's before my time. Um, but it was interesting, it was one of my first conversations that I had with Dr. Don when I arrived. And I asked him, do you remember those days? And he does. Throughout this message, we'll return to this revival. Uh, by the way, I use the word message loosely today. I'm going to break a few rules, sorry, Dr. Watson. And today is going to be something more like a testimony. And yeah, we'll look at some text, but I want you to hear a testimony of what happened. And I could work with the Welsh revival in 1904, the revival in Chicago in 1858, 
or the Great Awakening with Jonathan Edwards. I could spend an hour on that easy. But the revival of 1971, for some reason, in terms of distance and of time, does not feel so far away. And so today, much of what I will share as a testimony actually comes from an old out-of-print book called Flames of Freedom by a pastor, Erwin Lutzer. And that's my only connection to this revival. I know him. That's it. Who would like a revival here? Oh, there's one hand in the back. I see Elaine is eager. <laughs> okay. Today... Let's take a journey and consider this question. What if revival came here? And I think as we ask this question and we seek an answer, I, it's my prayer that it would just stir up some holy discontent within us. That each one of us would consider our own hearts, our homes, our churches, Realizing and believing that change can happen. Okay? Are we good? Excellent. Let's do it together. So here's the map for today. Revival amongst us would result in three things. First, personal transformation. Second, it would result in family transformation. And third, it would result in church transformation. And I want to walk through each one of those today. But before we get into that, what is a revival? That's been a long conversation throughout history, but here's a few things that it isn't. First, it's not, it's not a large gathering or a growing church, okay? No, uh, you might be tempted, though, if you showed up the church on Sunday, there was 200 extra people. You might be tempted to think revival has come, but that doesn't mean a revival has come. Revival is more than numbers, if miracles were to take place, you might, be, you might be tempted to think that revival has come. But no, revival is more than miracles, incredible instances of providence, and dramatic answers to prayer. Praise God, those happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean revival. And a new burst of excitement is not a revival either. either. I mean, some of you might be in a church that doesn't have a pastor right now, and there's that excitement when you find a new pastor. There's that surge of like, yes, let's get on board and work together and begin this new era of ministry. But that doesn't necessarily mean revival either. So as we think about revival, let's distinguish between revival and revivalism as well. A revival is an unusual work of God, wherein God's people are brought into a right relationship with God and others. I prefer that definition over many other competitors. It's where God's people are brought into a right relationship with God and others, yielding their will to God's. Okay? Revivalism, on the other hand, it refers to set meetings or other efforts to prepare for God's work. And that's good. But there are some dangers to revivalism as well. People can start to think that revivals can be produced or manufactured just by playing the right song or having someone so expertly lead us to this morning. Okay? Um, sometimes it's the right invitation style or the most eloquent speaker. Okay? They think they can just spark a revival just like that. And sadly, many Christian groups and churches chase those particular emotional experiences, seeking to create revivals through human effort. But brothers and sisters, we know that the Spirit of God cannot be controlled by our techniques. Our responsibility is to prepare for his work and faithfully yield to him. Let's also recognize the distinction between personal revival and corporate revival. Many people in this room have undergone personal revival. Okay? I've heard some of your stories, and they're wonderful. Okay? Um, I think of my own parents. My parents, you know, years ago when I was just an infant, they were happily running their businesses well on their way to being millionaires. And then everything changed. They gave away their businesses, they sold some of them, and they just went into ministry. You look back at it and you're like, surely that was a work of God. It certainly seemed that way to uh, my, uh, my uh, grandparents. <laughs> 
But that's not really what I'm talking about today. What I'm talking about is a unique work of God which comes upon a community of believers, a corporate revival. So what would it look like if revival came here? First, I said personal transformation. Personal transformation. When revival comes to a church, it is intensely personal. When revival comes to a group, a seminary, a church, it's personal. As one man involved in the Canadian revivals put it, he said, revival is God's finger pointed at you. <laughs> okay? So what does this look like then? First, it looks like restitution. It looks like restitution. You're familiar with the story of Zacchaeus? Okay? Luke 19. Jesus enters Jericho, was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. That sounds very nice, okay, in the way, instead of just saying he's short. <laughs> so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry, come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's restitution. That's a paying back over and above. When revival comes, the, when the Spirit of God comes in an unusual manner, Christians suddenly go over and above to make things right, being more sensitive to their own sins. In the 1971 revival, Christians were admitting that they had cheated on their taxes, even sending checks unprompted to the CRA. Okay? That'd be interesting. Um, in one instance, a lady forgot to pay for a bag of potatoes. And yes, in 1970, 1971, it was 99 cents for that bag of potatoes. Um, she had forgot to pay for it. So she drove all the way back to the store to pay. Because her conscience was so sensitive, the manager's response, something must be going on in this town because you're the second person to do this today. Okay? Personal witnessing also changes in revival. People begin to perceive the spiritual peril and need of their neighbors. No more do the social norms of minding one's own business apply. Just like the apostles, people begin to go out to their neighbors. Have you read Acts 5.42 lately? That's what they do. In the 1970s revival, many began to share the gospel with their neighbors, not just simply inviting them to church. We must remember that many times, non-Christians have no interest or desire to enter a church. And rightfully so. They do not love Jesus. They do not love our prayers. They do not love our worship. And they do not love anything about it. We must share the gospel and lead our neighbors to Christ. As one description um, of the revival in 1971 was that God had, quote, cut loose the cords of the tongue. That's one, how one bystander saw it. One woman was so, initially, she was so shy, she wouldn't even call the babysitter. Okay? She was not a phone call person. But when revival came, she confessed her spiritual life before God. She proceeded to give her testimony in front of 1,300 people. Hmm. Personal witnessing changes. Prayer changes. Prayer changes. On virtually every page of Acts, if you're familiar, people pray, not just over meals, not just when someone is sick, not just when there's a need. Prayer permeates their lives. When revival comes, people finally pray with passion. 
time becomes less important, sleep becomes less important. In one instance in the Canadian revivals, after meetings in the evening, people would stay through the night praying and confessing, bringing sleeping bags for their kids. It kind of reminds me of Paul in Acts 20, where he's preaching through the night and Eutychus falls out the window. <laughs> okay. One couple on the way to this revival in 1971, they said, we knew we were coming to a showdown, but felt powerless to stop ourselves. Revival is intensely personal. It's a showdown between God and you. What if revival came here? There will be family transformation. Family transformation. When revival comes to a church, families and marriages are upended. The status quo can't continue. And what does this look like? It means marital reconciliation. Do you remember the celebrity marriage of King David and Princess Mikkel, daughter of Saul? They famously had a falling out because David was a dancer, okay? <laughs> um, it never really seemed to get resolved, though, because the end of the story is that Mikkel is childless, okay? Perhaps that's the story of your marriage, unresolved issues and bitterness. Or perhaps you remember Leah, you know? the first wife of Jacob. They both were tricked into that marriage. Okay? She was unloved, and that kind of puts it mildly, because Jacob very much preferred Rachel. And minus the polygamy, perhaps that describes your marriage. There's never really been love there, or it's been long gone. Harry and Evelyn Thiessen were active in their church in Winnipeg another city where the revival spread in 1971. And Evelyn was bitter. She was on the verge of leaving Harry. She was shaken by attending a meeting where a pastor admitted his need for God to transform his life, though. And so she's just like, oh, uncomfortable. She wants to leave him, but something's going on. And so she just, she resisted for weeks. And she was a, she was a deacon's wife. How could she... How could this all come to the light? It wouldn't look good. How could she admit her need before others? Overcome by bitterness, at one point she literally prayed this, God, I just don't think you can do anything at this address. That's what she said. How wrong she was. Sitting in meeting after meeting, her proud heart kept fighting. And just when she was about to yield to the Spirit, Harry looked over at her and said, let's go. And so they went and they confessed together. He too had been quietly resisting for far too long. For the first time in years, they communicated with forgiveness and transparency. God dissolved the bitterness between them. The sun had gone down on their unresolved anger for many a day. But finally, finally, a sunrise had come. When we're thinking about family transformation, we can also think about leadership. From Job offering sacrifices for his children, or Ephesians 5, 6, 5 4, which commands fathers to train their children. Okay? Leadership in the home is a biblical norm for men. But like Eli and others, we compromise and we're passive. We think that the church alone will spiritually train our children, and we shirk our responsibilities, but that changes when revival comes. One teenager in the revival had literally never heard his father speak about Christ in his life. Okay? They were a Christian family, but it just wasn't something his father did. But after the revival, his dad suddenly talked about Christ for 15 minutes straight. Okay? And the son was so aghast about this that he said, I feel like a preacher's kid. <laughs> and perhaps maybe there's a wife in here who's <clears throat> subconsciously elbowing their husband next to them. Um, 
you have responsibility too when we're thinking about family revival. If your husband suddenly stood up and took spiritual leadership in your home, would you drop your entertainment, your normal schedule, your way of doing things to follow his lead? It's easier said than done. Another thing that happens in terms of family transformation is forgiveness. Do you remember Colossians 3.13? Anyone? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. That's a very high standard. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In revival, forgiveness is everywhere. In Ohio, because yes, it spread that far, a girl hated her father for how he used to beat her mother before they became Christians. She could never really let go of it. That bitterness, even though they were Christians now and it had stopped, she couldn't let go of the past until revival came and she just wept before the Lord. One man hadn't spoken to his sister for five years. Well, guess what? That's over. And entire families were found at the front of churches proclaiming the forgiveness and reconciliation that had been found. Children testified, quote, we have a new set of parents. Bitterness and brokenness were being swept away as forgiveness took hold. Revival grips families, restoring what seems irreparable. What if revival came here? Third, there would be church transformation. There would be church transformation. When revival comes to a church, it's no longer business as usual. Pastor and people alike are revived and love begins to mend the conflict and dissension. And throughout the New Testament, it's easy to find a church in need of revival, isn't it? Have you ever taken stock? Corinth needed purity. Ephesus had lost its first love. Pergamum tolerated false teaching. Thyatira had a satanic underbelly. Sardis was asleep. Okay, Laodicea was blind and naked, spiritually speaking. Need I say more? Okay. Today, it's the same. A church in need of revival is easy to find here in Cochrane all the way through Calgary. One woman commented concerning the Canadian revivals, meetings would come, meetings would go, pastors would come, pastors would go, but the problems of the people remain the same. The revival has solved problems that were never previously resolved. But what exactly changes in the church? What does this look like? Well, it looks like generational unity. One evening in Saskatoon, the teens decided to have their own meeting after the revival service ended. Okay, It ended late, so they were just like, well, let's have our own thing afterwards. It was short-lived because the teens reported the next night, quote, we'd rather be with the adults. Since they quit playing church and are honest with God, we want to be with them right where the action is. When we adults get serious about our faith, our children and our youth cannot help but watch and wonder. I remember what my father said when I was a child. He said, when you're on fire for God, people will come to watch you burn. In another revival meeting, a teenager said, isn't it weird to hear elders admit their sins? A man asked the teenager, didn't you know about them? The teen quipped, of course, but they didn't think we did. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, our youth, our children see us. They see us in our churches. Too often, we play games. We discourage them, drive them away with our pettiness, our selfishness. Revival unites. And suddenly, music preferences, small disputes are swallowed up in love for the Lord and for one another. What also changes? It also, it looks like service. It looks like service, not a service. Service. Serving. We have this funny word in English, layman. Good, happy hunting, if you want to find that in the Bible. Okay? But many see themselves as consumers of church. What can I get? What programs do you offer? Many think that hiring a pastor, like, ensures that you don't have to do as much. You know, 
that attitude really dies in revival. Everyone, pastor and people, begin to work together for the advance of God's kingdom. Because lay men and lay women become go men and go women in revival. In the Canadian revivals, and not only did people volunteer, but whole new ministries started. Church members who receive revival would in fact then travel hundreds of miles to go visit other churches and tell them what has happened. But mostly when we're thinking about church transformation, the thing that stands above all else, what it looks like is love. It looks like love. Nothing, no other word better describes revival than love. Everything that we've said tonight, this day, could be traced back to that. Jesus commanded us in John 13 to love one another. Yet we know full well that we don't want to sit next to so-and-so when we show up to church. More than that, you breathe a sigh of relief when a certain person who may be annoying doesn't show up to Sunday school. Hmm. We are so prone to lovelessness because we are selfish people. Love the love of Christ. The love of Christ is the only remedy for our malady. Squabbles die a quick death in the midst of revival, in the hands of love. Um, years ago, as a part of a church that was in the midst of a pastor search, and we had taken a ballot, we had voted to have, uh, you know, a group of five or six people who would be on the search committee. When they read all the votes, and then they stood up to announce. They read the names, and then there was a murmur that went through the church. You know, that kind of feeling. My thoughts were quite clear that day. <laughs> Why was there such unrest? No one had done anything immoral. Didn't we pray fast and agree together, pursue the Lord to select this team? Couldn't we trust him without murmuring like the Israelites? A church consumed with revival love would have no time for such foolishness. We would be too busy praying for the team and supporting them however we could. Having taken this journey together today, what will be some final lessons for us as we think about this testimony from out in Saskatoon? One, revival's not here. Revival's not here. At least not yet. Perhaps the Spirit will dramatically move among us, even today. But if we sit in our seats and we think that we're all right, our marriages are perfect, and our families are getting by, and our church doesn't need revival, we're just deluded. We're probably asleep like the church at Sardis. Two, revival starts with you. Do I have to do it again? You. <laughs> not your spouse, not your pastor, not your parents, not your children, not the church down the street. Don't wait for anyone else. Revival starts with you yielding to the power of God and his spirit, being willing to love, forgive, reconcile, and serve. Don't look anywhere today except at your own heart. Three, revival demands change. Are we too stuck in our ways to be revived? <laughs> Are we willing to change even a small habit? Are we willing to lay down pride, status, that other things that we have accumulated to openly confess our hard heart? Could we embrace change in order to embrace the movement of God here? Fair warning. All right, this is a warning to each one of you and to myself. In every revival throughout history, there are people who go to every single meeting. They see everyone else's transformation 
and they are hard-hearted and unchanged. Every revival in history has those people. Let it not be us. Sailboats are remarkable. Um, a distant relative of mine, he actually, for a number of years, he had a big sailing vessel to do whale watching off the coast of Grand Manan Island, which is off the coast of New Brunswick. Yeah, it's out there. Okay. <laughs> um, all they have are sails. When the sails are down, it's lifeless. But when the sails are up, and the wind blows, what vitality surges through that vessel? It takes off. Brothers and sisters, this is a simple request. Put your sails up. If the Spirit of God blows among us, among our churches, are we prepared to be moved by his power? raise the sails today. Do not harden your heart and prepare to be moved. So just as I finish here, just bow your heads, close your eyes. Get right with God and with others. Don't wait for anything. Don't worry about your pride. If you have a grudge or bitterness, would you even go to others in this place right now? If necessary, leave and make a phone call. Love one another as Christ has loved you. Forgive one another as you have been forgiven. Let's take a moment to meditate and listen. God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Oh, Father, how greatly we are forgiven. How greatly we are loved. We healed afresh. your love, your forgiveness flow through us. You see our sins. You know our innermost heart. We let go. We let go of these things that we cling to, these habits, these bitternesses. We say we'll go with you wherever you go. Your, your kingdom come through us, even at our expense. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen.